What's up, world? And welcome to the All Real Show. This is where we discuss issues pertaining to the socioeconomic system and how they relate to everything. Why and how are the fundamental questions. Answer them enough, you get to the truth. I'm your host, Alex, and welcome back to my discussion with musician and amateur author Henry Peterson. We'll cover a lot in this episode about diseases of despair, how individuals handle that, and society reacts to it. But first, we'll pick up where we left off at the end of last episode, talking about the rigged economic system we live by. You know, so uh, that's kind of the point I was trying to make, that everything will get worse and everything, you have to be ruthless. You know, even really back, if you say, and I know because I've seen figures like that where they were making uh, the CEO, whatever's making 40 times more now that. Well, first of all, even the 40 times is unacceptable because like kind of like you were saying about Bezos and Zuckerberg and these people, what the hell are you doing? What are you? I don't, it, so how are you making so much more money? Yeah, it's almost like immoral or unethical. I mean, it, it is like when, when people are starving and people are and, and then one guy has. A, I mean, what's he going to do? He's going to die like everybody else. I mean, what, what can you do with that money? I mean, yeah. it's just it's so sick. I mean. But that's like the culture. I mean, if you, you know, it's just, that's the thing that's celebrated here, really. And I bet most people, even like the poor in the, the you know, the people in the, um, you know, the people in the really challenged areas, like, sort of celebrate that. Like, they vote for these, right. these politicians who really support that kind of thing. And it's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, it's so screwed up. And then if you start talking like the, the way we're talking and you get labeled a communist or you're mm-hmm. whatever or socialist. And it's just, I mean, it's, people have been so brainwashed. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't, but I know just, just things just don't feel right. No, but you have some of the right ones. I mean, a lot of the stuff you're saying uh, you're, you you grasp it, you get it. And like you just said, that's, that's a big one. I mean, um, you kind of labeled me socialist. I don't believe me. It's like, I always say, if you can say anything to me, you can even joke on me. I'm, I joke about anything, including myself and people can do it with me. I know if you mean it as a joke, whether it's funny or not, that's different. But when somebody says something, you know, um, in, in a different context, I know that too. So no, I don't take offense. Somebody says, Oh, you're, you're this or you're that. Or, and by definition, it would be, I, 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 from, you know, it would be more socialist, but again, honestly, for me, I don't, I don't see any of that. I don't associate with any of that. Um, yeah. because again, first of all, it's, it's preconceived ideas and notions and stuff like that. And, Basically, with that, with most things, my problem is it, it's like I say, words are for description, not definition. But most people take words as definition. So if you say socialist, people instantly have an idea of you. And if you're socialist, you can't be something else. Yeah, it's just so it's just, it's so screwed up too. Because I mean. We have so many things. I mean, it's like socialism for the rich here too. I mean, right. there's no too big to fail in capitalism. It's it's absurd, you know. I mean, I I either some economists that I was were read, was reading and listening to on YouTube, and they they talked about um, how you know, I mean, how you know, capitalism is a system of profits and losses, and like the losses are almost more important than the profits because if a company is screwing up, making bad decisions, and they lose money, like then you know, like other people are supposed to come in and take their assets and start over again and manage things better, you know, like that, like that, that clears out the incompetent people, you know. But uh, one economist was saying what happened with the bailouts, you know, people, companies were mismanaged and then they would, you know, run into financial trouble and the government would bail them out with taxpayer money. So you're sort of like incentivizing this bad behavior, right. really. And it's like, I mean... That's that's not supposed to be happening in capitalism, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like I'm talking like I'm an expert. I'm not. I'm just a layman who's trying to write a book about my <laughs> friend who was addicted to drugs. But I always talk about the economy and how how doomed we are. It makes me want to go out and do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, and and I, I do want to get back to that now. But um, that's, you know, that's all right. I wasn't trying to steer it back for any you know particular reason. I, I'm happy to talk about this stuff. I think this stuff is interesting and. 
I've thought about this stuff so much over the years, over the last 10 or 12 years, not because I, I want to be some fancy economist or whatever, but I just want to understand, try to understand what's happening in my town and why things are getting worse and like right. what is going on in the world. And it's just, it's, it's hard to really, I mean, I have an idea of, I think of some things that are going on, but it's just hard to, they make it hard to just, you know, really figure out what's going well, on. You hear so many contradictory things. And exactly. supposedly before the pandemic, the economy was never better. I mean, I think that's a bunch of bull, you know, well, it's just, it's, like you said, they, they make it hard. And that's another key phrase because they do, they purposely make it hard. The same way if you watch, you know, the, uh, the, uh, stock exchange ticker it just you know it looks like a bunch of hieroglyphics and you don't understand and when you hear these people yeah, talk sure, about sure. it but in reality it's very simple it's just it, it's a made up scam that's all it is just like money itself but what i want to say about that henry is it took me a while i've always been like you said the person i want to know the truth i want to seek it out i really want to know the truth i don't care how much I don't like it or agree with it or whatever. And I've always, so I've always been that person. I've always been very intuitive and, and these types of things, but it really didn't, the way I try to explain it is I've always understood the pieces of the puzzle. So kind of like what we're doing now, we're talking about the different pieces of the puzzle we call life. And I've understood a lot of those and I've figured out more as I went in life. And then even me being what I consider smart and knowledgeable and all that type of stuff, it wasn't until probably late 20s, maybe early 30s, so I forget exactly, where basically I, I watched a documentary called Zeitgeist. It's funny you said that earlier, and you actually put that in your writing, so I, of course I caught it. But um, if you want to know a lot of what I'm saying and if you really want to see things from a different or at least have them presented from a different perspective. Watch the zeitgeist documentaries. It's changed so many people's lives. It's woke so many people up. I, I personally, honestly, I, I advocate for them all the time uh, that you're not going to find a better laid out explanation. And these are facts. This isn't somebody just, you know, saying, okay. yeah, saying stuff that sounds good. Yeah. If you just, obviously, you know, the word you wrote it and used it in this. So yeah, if you just look that up, Zeitgeist documentary or whatever, you can actually watch them all free on uh, whatever. Okay. The, yeah. I promise you, Henry, you will start to see things differently because there's, it's crazy because money dictates people's lives, everything you do, but yet nobody understands it. And that's what's really odd and interesting in a sad way. You know, obviously they don't teach it in school because they don't want you to understand it, but then nobody understands it. Nobody understands it. And it's not even the, all of the, the technical figures like I was talking about. Nobody actually understands money, like how it's created, where it comes from. The, you know, you might say, well, the Federal Reserve. Yeah, but you don't know kind of past that. And so when it's laid out and and you, you're smart enough and intuitive enough, and we've talked, you know, enough. And of course, I've read your writing. I think you will get it. You, you know, you'll understand. And again, it's laid out very simple. But, um, so, uh, but everything is is related, like like we said earlier. So that's why I think the economic is is so huge because it really translates to everything else. It's kind of like the example I tried to give of, you know, if there was five people in a room and five things to keep you alive, that's trying to put it in a very, you know, simplistic, again, zoomed in view, but that's the reality of the world. So people feel like there's not enough. That's why people do what they do. That's why you go to work five, six days a week and you do all these things and everything that you do in essence, it's because you assume there's not enough. You know, you're like, well, yeah, there's enough of this, but they still have to make a profit. They have, to, you know, um, but once you understand, it's 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 very simple. And what I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but what I was trying to say is how you were commenting before I started rambling just now about everything seems very convoluted, right? It seems very chaotic 
that's because you're thinking about everything, what I call, within the box. Everything that's that you know of. Finances, individual. You see, you're looking at everything that we see in the world going on. So it seems like there's a whole lot of stuff to take in and analyze and think about. But in reality, it's extremely simple. And just to finish, one of the, the ways that I try to say that um, is if you started, if you took everything that we know minus all the imaginary shit that we came up with. So if you took an earth and you put people on it and you said, I want these people to survive. If you want them to kill them, it's pretty easy. If you want them to survive and then you start from that point. Okay, well, what do they need to survive? They need food. Is there enough food? No? Well, well, let's figure it out. If you say yes, okay, go to the next thing. What else do they need? Water. Is there enough water? See? Okay, what do they need? Housing. Is there enough house? Yes. See, so people call that socialism, and they try to put labels on it, but to me, it's elementary. I don't understand any other way, and it's like yeah. I, it's like I say, if you're not, you, you know, anybody isn't with that, and you go back to the competitive mindset, well, then where do you draw the line? Because I'm the type of person, I'm an extremely, I try to be a nice person, but I have no problem taking your stuff. Or if that's the game we're living by, you know, doing away with you to survive. So is that the game we're playing? Because if so, see, then people would say, well, no, that's illegal. So then where's the limit? We're either with each other or we're against each other. And if we're with each other, supposedly, then the the analogy I tried to use of if you just had the planet and the resources and all this and you and you did that in your head, you would see it's actually very simple. See, because everything else we've just come up with all these imaginary numbers and figures and jobs. And 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 of course, you see people. Let me just say this too: people start using the word utopia and utopian. Again, if you want to put a label on it, I don't really care what you call it. But what I'm saying is, then what are we here for? No, and things aren't going to be like that. Not everybody is created equal. There's going to be people that's better at this or that or not as good or, you know, whatever. But it's, it's like the, the Carl Sagan saying, you know, an organism at war with itself, it, it will fail. And we're, we have to understand that. We feel separate because I'm not touching you at the moment. But, of course, with quantum physics, we're understanding that's different. Sure. Entanglement and that kind of stuff, sure. Right, man. Um, yeah, see, it, it's too bad. I mean, it, it is an economic system that just puts people at, uh, at odds with one another, you exactly. know? Exactly. everyone at each other's throats and stuff. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think it is driving a lot of the mythologies that you'd mentioned, diseases of despair. I mean, you know, I mean, it's... It's definitely gotten worse, you know, like like we talked about just the right. addiction, of course. I mean, um, you know, like the rise of hate groups, you know, suicide. At least the mass shootings, I, I remember talking to my friend about it just in the last, the, just the last few years, you know. Um, it just, there was a one, yes, there was just, I mean, just, I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, there was one that I, it was really in the news the there was a guy who went into the McDonald's in California, I think it was, and shot some people. And that was I mean, I'm sure there were some other ones too. I mean, that was before the twenty four hour news that had really started. Um mm-hmm. yeah, but I mean now you just, you you hear about it all the time with the guy with the Mandalay Bay, that was one of the worst where you know, and then just, I mean, there's so many, and we, we wouldn't even be able to, to remember all the ones in right. the last five years. So you wonder, like, what is really going on? I mean, people had guns in the 70s and 80s, too. I mean, what is mm-hmm. driving this? And I think that, yeah, that just this, um, like, society is just sort of breaking down. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's economic. When people are squeezed that way economically, they just... uh they start to snap, you know, and mental health. Well, least, it, their mental health starts to suffer. It, it is in general, obviously, it's it's the decline of society and stuff, and and it's one of those that I mean, unless you just took individual uh, people and analyzed them, but in a general sense, it's kind of hard to 
you know, say because it's a lot of theoretical, hypothetical there. Like, well, it could have been this factor. It could have been that. It's definitely society as a whole. Um, but an interesting point um, is how most things, again, in society aren't really what they are appear to be. In fact, nothing hardly is what it appears to be. Um, so, and I, you mentioned too in your writing about uh, rehabs for you know drug addiction and stuff have over ninety percent failure rate, and I could say why I think and uh, you know, but with your experience, um, you had some um, um, in hands on so to speak experience with the with that and the rehab centers. What did you take away from that? Yeah, I mean, I think it was something like, I mean, that might not be an official figure, but it's close to it. I mean, I would it's watch these. Yes. Yeah, it, it's definitely up there. And that's probably something that they don't want to really publicize too much. <laughs> of course. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy theory, but um, yeah, I'm sure that information is out there. But mm-hmm. I would watch people tell their stories on YouTube and they'd say, um, someone would say, I went to a rehab with 50 people. Uh, uh, and six months later, two of us, me and my friend are still, me and one other are still are clean now, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, and I, I, somewhere along the way, I heard that statistic, you know, 90% or something like that. I feel like, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, maybe it's a testament to how bad the problem is and how, you know, what a lifetime burden the addiction is. And mm-hmm. I, I, in the beginning, I was really naive. I thought, I had no idea. I didn't even really understand the physical dependency of it. I mean, I had read Miles Davis's biography, and he had talked about being a heroin addict, and the guys in the band were heroin addicts, and they talked about getting sick and stuff. But I read that in the '90s, and I didn't. I knew there were legendary jazz musicians that were heroin users, and I, I knew getting sick, I guess, was a part of it. But I, I didn't even understand. Four years ago, I didn't even understand the physical dependence and how you right. had to go to rehab or whatever. So. And I thought, well, the big experience that I took away was when I saw her going, it's just that people, her in and out of rehab, which is people just didn't really want it. They didn't want it. They were just going for, a lot of times it was court mandated. Right. And in her case, it was a couple of times. So it's just a get out of jail free card for people. And mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not taking a shot at them. I mean, I'd be the same way too, you know. Right. I just think if you're not ready mentally to do it, it's not going to work. And I mean, the rehabs are, I saw a vice program on YouTube about it. They're really like a big business kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. There are really some swanky ones that in California, I think in Florida and a bunch of other places where they cater to people with money and it just becomes like there are these exorbitant fees and uh, where you just can't even justify it. Like several, I, I don't even know, maybe it's like $30,000, $60,000 for a 30 day stay or something. It's just, it's crazy. And you think like, right. what is is that necessary? What are people getting? Exactly. But I think a big thing was just if you're not ready to do it, I mean, I think it's hard enough even when you are ready to do it. Right. And again, just to bring it back to my life, I mean, I could, I try to relate it to some of the addictions I've had or whatever, even though it's not heroin addiction. But when I was heavy and I wanted to lose weight, I eventually did lose weight a couple of different times in my life, but there were many times when I even said to people, and I said to myself, this is it, I'm gonna, I'm, and I meant it, I, I thought, this is it, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get in shape, I mean it, and I, I meant it at the time, I wasn't lying, and then mm-hmm. it was, I didn't do it because it's difficult, and there's some, right. there are a lot of factors that go into the overeating, and so maybe that's a not a fair analogy because I know heroin addiction is, is very strong. I know struggling with weight issues is, is a really strong and difficult thing to overcome too. But so I just feel like you've got to want it so much. Yes. You've got to have, I guess, a good support system. You have to have the, the you know, like skills to, it's a lot of things. It's just, mm-hmm. it's such a big issue and you have to, um, you know, listening to, there was, there, like I said, there were some great YouTube channels where people would tell their stories and there was a guy who was, um, addicted to pills, and he talks about getting clean. He helped other people, and he just said, you know, you when you decide to get clean, you've got to face all the stuff that you've done. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it just, I mean, it, it might not even be overt stuff. Not, you know, it, my friend, you know, Naomi was never, 
she never really did anything illegal. She wasn't, she never stole from anyone. She didn't really do anything other than hurt herself. But people have to face all these, you have to face the thing that you're running away from in the first place. Right. Whatever, you know, the trauma or, you know, and then on top of that, what you've done to yourself, uh, you know, as far as, you know what I mean? Just kind of, mm-hmm. and I'm sure there's a lot of guilt and just. Oh, of course. Of course, yeah. yeah so you've got to face all that stuff. Too, so it's just it makes it really difficult. I think you really have to want it, and, and that is key, Henry. Uh, you you've mentioned yeah. it a couple of times, and I I was going to say it after you said it, but you're exactly right. That is absolutely vital. You have to want. It doesn't matter what else happens, and this is where you mentioned about the uh, also in some of your writing about the criminal justice system's approach to addiction and kind of relates to what we're saying now that that is a big thing because it doesn't matter what, how many fines they give you. It really doesn't even matter if they lock you up for a year. I mean, yeah, some people may come out and not be able to go back not go back, but it really has to be the person wanting it with everything that they have. They have to come to that point where they are truly Done, and for most people, unfortunately, especially with drug addiction, that's when they hit absolute rock bottom, and there's nowhere to go but up. Yeah, and yeah, I agree. And it's yeah, like I said, just bringing it back to my life. You know, when I finally lost weight, I did want it a lot, and and, and you have to kind of keep that feeling uh, consistent too. You have to have some like right. continuity with that too. I mean, it, it's it's a really uh, the whole lifestyle change and mm-hmm. um you know i'm talking like i've been through it i haven't been through it. i've just been through the weight loss thing but yeah i mean it's it's a really it's a huge mountain that you have to face and, and very few people really really do get clean and right. um with naomi she got into a methadone treatment program so there are some issues with that and methadone if you look into it you know it's it's for people who look into it it's pretty controversial some people say it saved their lives and other people say it's just legal heroin and it's just yeah well methadone you and, methadone is synthetic heroin basically yeah basically yeah i mean basically mm-hmm. so i had mixed feelings about it in her case it i would have preferred for her to just go you know without any um substance replacement thing therapy, right. you know what i mean um but uh yeah, she's, you know, they made her stable, and it's it's a lot safer because she, and she's been doing the methadone program for two years. Before that, before she got into it, um, the program, it was it was just, it was bad. I mean, it was just, I mean, I don't have experience with any other heroin users, so I can't really compare it to anything. But it, it, I would say it was pretty, on a scale of 1 to 10, it was about, as far as being out of control, her life being out of control, it was easily at uh, nine, I'd yeah. say. I mean, she couldn't make any plans for, you know, she couldn't see her family on holidays or anything. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, it's just all, her Con- whole consumer. life was just uh, getting the drug and just having it not being sick. And mm-hmm. um, so that was just, I mean, there was no room for anything else. So this has made her stable and she takes her dose every day and, but she's, she's just really not, uh, her, it kind of spaces you around, it kind of zombifies you. She's not, she's still in there, and but it's just, it, it's sort of like, I don't know, it just kind of, <laughs> it's just, it sort of takes away your, you know, your, flattens you out. It kind of takes away the the spark. Right, exactly. Oh, it's, it's there sometimes, and it's, of course it's still there, but it's just, it sort of flattens you out. Know, it's and, subdued. Yeah, so... You know, but considering where she was, where she was, I mean, it, it is, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm 100% happy with it, but her plan is to get off of it too at, so at some I, point. And I know it's very difficult. It's, the half-life is much longer than heroin. It, it's, it, people say it's much tougher to get off methadone. So after two years, there, she's still taking heroin? I mean, I, I'm sorry, uh, methadone? Yes, yeah. And that's another thing, too. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, you know. At what point do, yeah. do they stop it? I mean, that's excessive. Well, the thing is, they let, you, they let you steer it, really. I mean, you can go in, and that's another thing with these clinics. You can just go in and say, 
you know, I don't think 70 milligrams is doing it for me. Can you up me to 75? And, and nope, people go up to, she has a friend who's at 110 milligrams or 120. I've heard of people going up to the two and 300. I think 300 is really high, but she was on 105 milligrams, I think. And now she's down to 70 and she's going to try to wean herself. So you know, again, they're, off it. But, they're yeah, but they, they, basing that off of the person actually wanting yes. to stop. Yeah, and I think that there's maybe a financial incentive for them oh, to not stop. Of you know? course. Um, but they'll let you stay on it for, there are people who are on that stuff for decades. <laughs> uh, you know, I, which is crazy. It's crazy, it's you know? It's crazy, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's where the situation is now. And, and we're so close friends. I see her all the time. We go for walks and. Uh, Oh, so you guys and, have remained friends. I, I didn't I didn't know to go to the kind of end point with you with that, but now that you mention it, I, I was curious of that. Yeah, we're still really good friends. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah, it worked out well. I couldn't imagine not being friends with her. She was uh, you know, an important person for me and just important in ways that helped me kind of get a better view of myself and mm-hmm. kind of crystallize my thoughts about some of the other things we talked about as far as like the economy and everything. I mean, right. You know, just put, put, you know, put my, she helped me put my, uh, kind of, uh, thoughts about some things into perspective. And, but yeah, no, we're still great friends. And, uh, so I guess the story is still ongoing, although the, mm-hmm. the best part or maybe the worst part of it is over. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say the best part. I mean, the best part drama wise, I mean, right. Cause there were some crazy you know, encounters with the cops and just, I mean, it's a miracle that I didn't go to jail. I yeah. Mean, it's just, you know, but then you get into it and then like you, like we we're saying, it does happen incrementally and then you get desensitized too. Right. And good point. Yes. And I mean, so if I just dove in and, and in the middle of it, I mean, I never would have been able to handle that, but it just, you know, it happened like incrementally and I'm taking her here to, to get something, you know, and the next thing you know, I'm in the middle of a drug deal and then it became common, you know, so, so I'm going to rehab next week. Just help me, please just take me here. If you don't take me, you know, someone else will, and I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to walk, I'll hitchhike and that'll be more dangerous. So why don't you take me? And then you just, you, you're, you just, I mean, you're up against the impossible. What do you do? Would you, yeah. Plus, I wanted to know what was going on. So it's, so, you know, you go and you're, 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 at least you know what's going on and you're there, but you hate what you're seeing and then you're in the middle of a drug deal and it's dangerous and it's like, it's, it's none of it makes any sense, but it's just an impossible situation. Right. You know, I, I, I don't envy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on anyone really. I mean, you know, people I'm sure have been through wars. I don't want to make it sound like I've been through a war or something, but in a way, it was kind of like a war. Yeah, it's it's a it's a mental war, and yeah. you know, um, you know, like you said, how enablers. Again, I know that has a bad connotation to it, and it could, but most people who are enablers have the best of intentions, and absolutely hindsight's 2020. So yes, you get to the end, you can look back and say, Oh shit, I, that was my fault. I enabled here. I did this, but going through it, enablers justify their actions because a lot of times, like I said, is with the best of intent. That's of course a rationalization, uh, technique, I guess, um, you know, of lesser of two evils and and it happens all the time. And like you were saying, you know, uh, if I don't take them to do this drug deal, you know, somebody else will or they, they're they going to be in more danger. And, of course, sometimes that's – well, a lot of times that's true. And that's where I think the dilemma lies, right? Because deep down you know that's true. You kind of know this person is going to do this whether I enable them or not. So how do you how do you come to terms with that? I mean, I don't think you can. You know, yeah. I, I've thought about I, I, you know, I've kind of thought about an analogy. It would be like and no one would ever accept this analogy, but so I don't know if it's good or bad. But it would be like you know, say my I have a couple of friends and they want to rob a bank or something, and they say, "Will you drive the car? Do you come along with us?" And they're friends I care about, and I say, "Well, you know." I don't agree with robbing the bank. I think it's dangerous. I think we're, it's wrong. <laughs> you know, I think you, mm-hmm. you can get in trouble. But then they say, well, if you don't 
if you don't drive us, we're going to have so-and-so do it and his car's not good and, you know, he'll help keep us safe. I mean, if I went along with that, no one would ever be sympathetic. Right. People would say, I mean, maybe that's a stupid, I mean, you know, maybe that's not a good analogy. But, just, but part of it is probably, probably holds up, you know what I mean? Yes. But it, part of it's probably an unfair analogy. Um, because it's, it's just more nuanced than that. So but to answer your question, you just, you wind up kind of hating yourself a little bit. I mean, I didn't beat myself up about it that much, but I mean, I mean, I wasn't really, I mean, I'd go on a drug run with her or something afterwards. And then, I mean, I'm not exactly proud of it. And if anything, I, you know, kind of like ashamed of it. it, but some part of me thought, well, it was good that I was there, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. I mean, it, you know, I got to be good friends with her mother because her mother would call me a lot and, and want to know what was going on and want to know. She knew I was a good influence and I wasn't right. doing drugs and stuff. So, um, and I would feel like kind of a little guilty about it. I mean, mm -hmm. so much stuff. <laughs> but that's understandable. But, yeah. I, but I knew, yeah, but I knew I didn't, I didn't really did I do anything wrong. I mean, it's not, it's, it was a weird kind of thing. I mean, I don't, you know, some people might say it was wrong, but I heard a story. There was a, it made me feel a little bit better. There was a clip of Dr. Phil. Not that I watched Dr. Phil's show. Really. I, I don't, but <laughs> you have to throw that Phil. out there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I know, it's funny. But there's a clip of, I think it was Dr. Phil's show on uh, YouTube, and um, they were talking about addiction, and he had a, a woman... Uh, and her daughter on and the daughter was a heroin addict. She was probably in her early twenties or something. And the woman talked about doing some of the stuff I did, like driving her to get drugs and stuff. And I thought, well, you know, like, yeah, it happens. Probably happens. I mean, obviously it happens to other people where they're in that position. And yeah, it's just, it's, I mean, there's no right or right answer to, you know, should, I mean, some people might think there is, but I mean, I think it's just kind of a, a gray area. I mean, yes. I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Like, even after all this time, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Well, the analogy you use with the robbery, I mean, uh, obviously there's some similarities. I think, and I know, like you even said, it's not the best analogy, but I think in some cases it's it's not a gray area because – Going into it, for example, like in a case like that, yeah, you can rationalize and justify, you know, and it, you would be right by saying some of that stuff. But ultimately, you kind of know going in, this isn't right. This isn't a good choice. But that's I agree with you that that is what makes it so murky in such a gray area in Things like addiction and stuff, drug addiction, uh, uh, because you don't, there is no clear right and wrong. You know, there is no easy answer. And, you know, like I said, you're doing it with the best of intentions. And, you know, most of the time, obviously, whatever your relationship is to the addicted, you have emotional attachment because obviously if you didn't really know the person or have, you know, care for them, you, you're not going to go through all that. That means it, it's, it's very difficult. It really is. And and that's what, again, uh, to go back to your writing um, and your book that I liked and I, I, I agree. I, I thought the same that I, it was interesting because it was kind of from a different vantage point than, you know, just a person who's addicted. And so many people go through this and don't know, you know, where to go to get an honest opinion. You know, you can call a lawyer, you can talk to a rehab person, but you know, they're giving you the, the, you know, their vantage point or their polished answer or whatever the case. So I just think it's interesting to, um, you know, that people could, like read what you wrote and people like you that, you know, have been enablers and given their experience of it. Yeah. I think unless you're in that position, it's hard to know what you would do. And it's yeah, it's so easy to say, like I would talk to my friend who was a rational, you know, rational, really rational, thought the whole thing was ridiculous. And he would just say, <laughs> yeah, to him it was just easy, you know, just right. so well, how could you be there? Like, what are you doing? You, you know, bringing your food in a drug house. Of course, that's enabling that you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be doing it. But if it were his wife, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, take it when he wasn't my wife, of course, but it was someone I really cared about. Right. If it were his child or his 
sister, his exactly. whatever, you know, maybe he'd feel differently. And, and I, I did feel that way about her. So, and again, it was just, I wanted to be, I wanted to know what was going on, even if it was kind of horrible. I mean, I just wanted mm-hmm. to, just the thought of her being out there without me was kind of, uh, I didn't like it, you know? Yeah, well, that's another big thing, Henry, uh, of course, is that at most, almost everybody hates not being in control. I mean, you know, to control to some extent, um, you know, uh, like if, like if there's somebody you love or care about and they're suffering or, um, you know, in, in, say in a hospital in some condition or something, and there's nothing you can do. That is one of the worst feelings. So that again, I think is another big p- part of an enabler's, uh, mindset is, you you feel that and you're kind of right by thinking that that you are in some control you know if you just let them run amok out on the street you of sure. course don't know what's happening and so your mind's eating you up but you you have absolutely no control you know there's no rational input you know the the person's probably, yeah. right they're probably surrounded by other druggies or whatever that's saying Stupid shit, you know, because they're on drugs. At least you're a, a voice of reason. So, yeah, it is enabling. It's it's a tricky thing. It really is a gray area, like you said. It's it's, and people don't know what they would do unless you're in that situation. Yeah, I think there is no right and wrong. Really, it just depends on how you look at it. Because mm-hmm. you can even think of it. You know, I, I I thought about a lot of stuff there. I would buy her. I, I started buying her um, uh, syringes. You know, she'd send me to the pharmacy and I'd buy them. The first time I did it, it was, it was I was conflicted about it. I thought, oh, God, this is the right thing to do. And But I knew, I thought, okay, either there are cities that have, and Syracuse is one of them, that have needle exchange programs. Mm-hmm. And it's really a harm reduction thing. So they give out needles and and I know those, those programs have been criticized. Those policies have been really severely criticized. People would say, oh, you're encouraging it right. uh, or whatever. But, you know, it's a harm reduction thing. And, and I kind of look to that as, I don't want to say justification, but I thought, okay, if those programs exist, maybe what I'm doing is not so bad. I mean, those programs, I, mean, I don't know of any cities that provide transportation to free Uber to, like, drug dealers, <laughs> drug houses. So, I mean, so I, obviously I was stretching a little bit and doing some stuff maybe I shouldn't have, but it's just, the whole thing was just crazy. And sometimes life doesn't make any sense. And Well, that is actually, Henry, that is a very, very good point. As a matter of fact, I've been in that exact conversation on multiple occasions with people about the needle exchange. Uh, but that is a very good, interesting point to relate to what we're saying about the enabling, because when you're in it and you're dealing, you know, um, uh, decision by decision basis, you know, that is where we're very difficult and gray area. But to me, when you talk about a needle exchange um, and things to that effect, I am 100 percent for it, because the most common thing that people have or the times that I've been in this discussion anyway about needle exchanges, every time almost the person, the other person has said what you just stated, that it's, it's wrong, it's dumb, it encourages. And I, I fundamentally disagree with that because what they are not understanding about a addiction like needles, you're not talking about pot or even drinking you're talking about hardcore addiction. This stuff takes you over your body and your mind, of course. So the point being is these people are going to do that, whether they have a clean needle or not. And they are go- sure. they are going to do it, whether they have a safe house to do it in or whether they have to do it in some abandoned house, drug house. And so, again, you know, like we were saying, that's why I think that's a very good point because – you know, technically that could be considered enabling and like, you know, depends on how you look at it. It kind of is in a sense, but that's where, like most things, I think you have to have an informed decision because again, to me, those people that are saying things like that's enabling, that's encouraging. I 
really feel that they don't understand the problem because I know addiction. Like I said, I thankfully have never been gripped by it myself with drugs, but I know I've been there like you. I've been surrounded by it and understanding what it is, is that's just the smart, right thing to do. And in fact, you got to think when you bring them in like that, if you know, these people know they can go there and be safe and not be beaten, raped, taken advantage of, arrested, you know, you can go there and, and encourage and, you know, depending on how you approach it, but anything, anything from pamphlets to have people there that, uh, you know, psychologists and drug counselors. And so uh, you're not just letting these people be to their own devices. Um, cause that's ultimately what they need. They need help. However, that looks like to that person, but that's what they need help. You know, they don't need a, a criminal record and to be, you know, dug even deeper into a hole. I know. And the point you were making earlier, there's no way for the government and the criminal justice system to arrest people out of it. Or but you do I mean, occasionally you hear a story. And the first time she went to jail, I thought I was upset about it. I really was, but I thought, okay, some good will come out of it. I thought the good, the good thing was, I thought the good thing would be, so be, I just thought that'd be the end of it. I thought, well, she'll be forced to get clean. Of course. I mean, how can you not? You'll be in jail. Right. It'd be a huge wake up call. I was just thinking of what that would do to me. I mean, my God. Mm -hmm. So, um, I thought just, just, I was naive. I thought, of course I would visit. I was, I thought this is just the end. How could it not be the end? Right. But it wasn't the end at all. And, just listening to people's stories on YouTube, you, you do occasionally hear a story of someone who went to jail or prison and how that was the shock, the wake-up call that, that pushed them to get clean. Right. But those are not as... You don't hear as many of those as you, you think. Most of the time, it just really creates more baggage and more yes. trauma, and it just makes it worse. So she was in jail for... She just had minor charges, too. Just, you know, a possession charge... And then another possession charge, like I think they got rolled into one or something, and they were mm -hmm. fairly close together or something. So she, at one point, she went to jail for eight months, and I thought that would be the end of it, and it wasn't. It wasn't the end of it, right. and, which is you know, just it's hard to to think that it would be, you know? I mean, because I just think about myself. I, mean, I, I Maybe I'm being naive, but if I, I, I think that... I don't think I'm better than anybody with this kind of stuff, but I just think, God, wouldn't that be the wake-up call that you need? But it, 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 it's not for a lot of people. For most right. people, it's not. So, and if they're held out on using drugs, there's nothing anyone can really do. I mean, there's nothing. There's just nothing you can do. You can't, I couldn't kidnap her and lock her in my basement or something. Even if I did, what could I do? Exactly. I, mean, I could lock her in there for, even if I could lock her in the basement for eight months. I mean, what? Eight years, it's 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 not going to make any difference. No, well, she was that free will. She so. was locked in a jail for eight months. Yeah, for eight, know? eight months. Yeah, and I, I was so unprepared for it. I thought I would talk to her mother, and I'd go see her every week, and I sent her some books, some books that I thought were pretty good, good addiction books, and she was into them, and we talked a lot. But I didn't force it on her. I I just I thought, okay, eight months, you're gonna. You try to use it as an like, opportunity. Yeah, but, right. and, but and some of it was wishful thinking on my part, but toward the mm -hmm. end, just some of the stuff she was saying led me to really, I, I, I knew it probably wasn't going to be the turning point, but I thought, okay, maybe she'll relapse for a little, you know, a week or a couple of days and then, then get it together. But no, it really was, it kind of made things worse. And after she got out of jail, that long stretch, there was a period of insanity for another, I think almost another year. Well, another nine months or something. You mean insanity as far as her drug use and addiction? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just, it was just back. And I think one of the things that happens too, it's not, it doesn't crank up gradually. If you're really hardcore and you're shooting drugs and you're, she said she was doing about a gram a day or something like that, but it's hard to really know because, I think some of the stuff is not that pure or whatever. Yeah. But she was, I, I guess that's pretty hardcore when you're, I mean, when you're shooting here, when it, it's really, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. But she was, her life was pretty out of control. It was, it was bad before she went to jail. So I thought, 
you think, okay, well, she comes out, she relapses, it'll take several months or weeks to kind of crank up to that level again. But it doesn't. It kind of goes back to that level fast. Right. It went back within a month, I think. Well, you mentioned uh, there was a part in the writing that I, I picked up on, so I know it's there. But uh, you mentioned along the lines of what you're saying now, and um, you said uh, basically that um, it made it worse because she had said, um, you know, well, now I, I have all this. I have all these uh, fines. I have to go to court. It's it's like a heavier weight. It's even more stress sure, and yeah. burden, and that's yeah. how the the addict you know escapes it. <laughs> so, I know. So it's it's almost set up for failure. Yeah, you know? Exactly. More stress and more exactly stuff to worry about, and it's just more. Yeah, it's, it makes it worse. And I thought that it seems like that's the norm for most people. And usually, it makes it worse. It, well, it it absolutely does. Um, for the reasons we're saying, and you know, I, I mean, the word is 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 in the def is in the word criminal justice, which you know it's hard to put those together. Uh, but you know, yeah, so they entering a criminal justice system, but they're not a criminal. They are suffering. They're they're you know an addict. It, it's a totally yeah. different thing. Um, so, yeah, they absolutely there. I mean, you know, the big thing is police reform now, but the the whole system, like we were saying, from the economic all the way down has to be revamped, changed. And that's just a big I know, part I think of it. so, too. I think so, too. Yeah. And I mean, I think the drugs should, should all be legal, really. I, I I think there should be restrictions, of course. That you, I don't think you should be able to do heroin and operate a, a vehicle and Right. Put people in jeopardy. And that, of course, like just with alcohol, that should be against the law. But I really, I think that if, if someone's, of course, I would never condone it. I don't recommend it. But if someone wants to do drugs, I think they should be able to do drugs. I mean, if, if they're not endangering anybody else. Exactly. It's their decision. And yeah, I think that, yeah, the criminal justice system, I think it's just a moneymaker. It's just a. Absolutely. It's. it's it's not helping anybody. It's just making things worse. I've heard a statistic that I think 50% of people in prisons and jails are there for drug offenses. It's probably more than that. She was in, yeah, she was in jail. I would do these visits and like I said, I'd go every week and I, I got to see, <laughs> I'd never been the, to the inside of a jail ever as a visitor or as I've never been in trouble with the law myself. Uh -huh. But the, I mean, the, the visits were it just sort of this institutionalized kind of, mentality and all that. Right. It, just, it was, it, it was weird. And, and you'd go in and they would, the visits were, it was mostly women too that, that were seeing like their boyfriends or husbands or whatever in jail. And there would be a few, so they'd bring it and, and you'd be in a group of 10 or 15 people and you'd go in and it was like all women really pretty much. There'd be, there'd be a couple of guys, but, um, even visitors, I mean. Um, so I would go in and do these visits and, and she'd be, she told me about the friends she was making and some of the people there and stuff. And they were all, like, all her the other women that she was in with, they were all, it was all drug drug users. Right. I mean, I, it, maybe there were some people for some other offenses, but I think everyone that she told me about was a heroin addict or they had, mm -hmm. they were using some other drugs. And, and they're all pretty young, too. Right. She was 28 at the time. Yeah, so it's just sad. It's just, well, that did, it didn't do her any good. It, it just, exactly. I don't know what the answer it was, but I mean, it might have done good in the sense of maybe she would have overdosed and died if she wasn't there, but. It's the total wrong approach, though. I mean, again. Yeah, you, it's, yeah, of course, it's the wrong approach. Right. Like you were saying, you can always find examples of somebody, you know, that's like I say, you can yeah. always find somebody that wins a lottery, but the lottery's one in a hundred billion, you know, million or whatever. So yeah, sure. You could, you could find an example of, you know, you hear stories <laughs> of someone got into a terrible car accident and they almost died and it changed their life and right, they exactly. found religion or something. And there are those examples, but no one would ever want to be in a terrible car accident exactly. like that. And the majority of people who are in those situations don't probably don't get any positive, I mean, don't get any kind of mental, right. you know, transformation that comes from it. So, yeah, but yeah, that, that's a misconception that I had too. I really mm -hmm. thought, like I said, I really thought 
the first time she got arrested, I was bummed out, but I thought, okay, like, it's over. I thought, oh, obviously, it's over. Of course it's over. How mm-hmm. can it not be? Yeah. And her mother warned me. I talked to her mother about that. Her mother said, you know, I don't think this is going to be enough. I just didn't, I didn't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I couldn't, I didn't want to think that that was true. And she, her mother was absolutely right. Right. Well, that's the... Her mother was right about everything all along, really. <laughs> I was going to, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> that's the difference of experience and not, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, our mother was right about everything. And I was, trying to sell, I mean, I was this naive guy. At that point, I didn't know her that long. I mean, it mm-hmm. was just five or six months into it. And I'm, every time she was in trouble, I was you know, talking to her mother. Like, oh, I think this is the turning point, and we've got to be our own. I think this is over, and <laughs> I think it's going to be over. And I was just, I kind of made a fool of myself, but... No, what not I at know, all. You know, I, I'm I sure didn't her... make a fool of myself, but I just, I was naive. Right, exactly. And, and that's... That's to be expected. You never went through it. You never experienced. Yeah. And I'm sure her parents went through the same thing. They probably went through all the same thing you did. But, oh, yeah, they did. You know, experience and knowledge, you know, you can't stop somebody. You know, the same way you couldn't stop her, they couldn't stop you. And so they had to let it run its course and let you learn on your own. You know, and I just I wanted to go back a little bit uh, to the comment you made about all drugs should be legal. I I actually think that's a that's a big thing. And I I totally agree with that Um, for similar reasons that you said. And ultimately, this is something I say. I I even wrote a piece on it. Um, But people, humans, all people will ultimately, one way or another, try to do what they want to do, what they desire in their hearts, period. It doesn't matter what law you make. It doesn't matter how much you do it. Almost like you said, see, if you could lock her away. Well, technically, she was not technically. She was. You can lock somebody away. But when you let them out, you know, if whatever they are, whether it's good or bad, desiring or want to do or whatever, they're going to do it. So it's patchwork. And, you know, the same with drugs. As you can see, society can see you can make drugs illegal all you want. If somebody wants to do a drug, they're going to do it, whether they have to steal, rob, kill, uh, sell, you know, and then you criminalize them. And I just wanted to say about that also, I mean, you don't expect, believe me, a politician to say anything, you know, outside, too much outside the box or groundbreaking like we're talking yeah. about. But I didn't watch the whole thing, but it I think it popped up on my feed or something. I don't know. But it was Joe Rogan's podcast, and he had Bernie Sanders on there. And he asked him about that because they, they were going – it started with some drug policy or, you know, something to that effect. But uh, Joe Rogan asked Bernie Sanders, do you think all drugs should be legal? And, you know, instantly Bernie Sanders, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Uh, I would never. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's kind of a good Bernie voice, too. That's funny. Yeah, that was off the cuff. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, and then so he, you know, he gives his little piece and then uh, Joe Rogan hits him one more time, like, uh, you know, something to the effect of, well, you know, don't you think, and this is where I, another reason I say all drugs should be legal, but like all these drug cartels and all this stuff, you know, they would essentially not be there. They wouldn't function if drugs were legal. And so, yeah. you know, and then so, yeah, he, of course, says some political answer about, well, no, we need to take a different approach and, you know, all this stuff. But th- that's, uh, we could, again could talk about drugs or other stuff. I think all apply in similar ways, but since we're talking about drugs, that's the thing that, you know, people want to control and they want to subdue and they want to think they can banish something with a law or whatever. It's, it's much deeper than that. And, um, you know, if you made drugs legal, ultimately it would be a lot better. I think so too. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, Government's just wasting a lot of money. I mean, they're making money too. I mean, but it's just wasting money and resources, and no one's getting help, and things are just getting worse. So I think the war on drugs has been demonstrated to be a failure. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, that's coming to light now. That I mean, war on drugs. 
Again, what are you really, you know, saying or doing? You're you're going in poorer neighborhoods and doing this stuff, and yeah, you know, and and that's the thing. I mean, really, it should be glaring to most people. It's glaring to me. But how there's there's different rules for different people in society. So you know, everybody should know. And if you say otherwise, you're wrong. If I get caught with drugs, or if somebody with a lot of money, or some you know, s- suppose a high ranking person or whatever gets caught with drugs. What do you think the outcomes are going to be? They're going to be totally different. Sure. Nothing. I know nothing will happen. Right. So, you know, but ultimately, um, yeah, I mean, any approach uh, society takes as a whole, uh, what is the end result? What's the end goal here? And I, I think if anybody thinks about it rationally, what is the, point of locking somebody up who is addicted to drugs if if you're are you trying to really help this person rehabilitate this person those types of things because if so obviously that's not the way to go about it and you're seeing that yeah through the results of what happens i know i mean hopefully things will change i mean i'm sure in i've been willing to do that in 50 years you know people look back and 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 but hopefully by then things will have changed, but this approach is definitely wrong. I think, you know, it's not, not helping. So, yeah. And, you know, even I, I, like I said, I was familiar with methadone. Um, uh, I actually have taken, I've done it before. Um, you know, I've had my times with, with drugs and stuff, uh, you know, again, why I did them different reasons, um, thankfully I've never been hooked on anything or anything like that. I'm past it now, you know, now. Oh, that's good. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. I've, well, you know, again, everybody's different. Everybody goes through different changes, but for quite a while now I've, I've, you know, I, I smoke a little weed here and there and that's it. I don't even hardly drink anymore, but that's just me. You know, that's the point I've got, yeah, sure. you know, I've gotten to and, but I'm, I can speak from experience on a lot of things and, um, it's crazy to even that, to, that, you know, she's doing or they're still providing um, methadone to somebody who's supposedly supposed to be getting off of drugs, yet they're steadily supplying them with drugs. I know. She'll be able to stay on it as long as she wants, which is. Uh, and it, it's it's a synthetic it's, heroin. It's her decision. Yeah, it is. It's weird. And Yeah. You'll find it's really controversial. I watched mm-hmm. lots of YouTube videos and watched went to forums and stuff. And people, it's really a polarizing thing. People are in camp, one or two camps. It seems like they think it's great. And I, I think that, I mean I you know I I, I have my I kind of gra- I gravitate more towards you know from my perspective. I've never been involved with opiate addiction, thank God. Mm-hmm. But I, ideally, like for Naomi, I didn't want her to be on it, so I kind of gravitate more towards the abstinence-based recovery approach. Right. But, yeah, it's very cool. People will say it saved their lives. Other people have said that they were zombies for decades. It was the worst thing. It was worse than heroin. It was So it's just hard to really you stick through all that. You wonder what's... But I know that her life now is better than it was two and a half years ago. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, but, obviously, she, that's she wants to She wants to keep tapering, too. So, um. When she does get off of it, we'll see how things are. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I, obviously for for her sake and yours and everybody who's involved yeah. in in their life, you you hope they do. You know, you hope they can find other stuff again again because typically you're filling some kind of void. I mean, um, e- even with with pot, you know, with weed or whatever. I heard um, a thing years ago that stuck with me, and I I like this the saying or whatever. And I think it applies to most things, but they said, um, pot is supposed to enhance your life, not be your life. And obviously with some things that are very addictive, like, you know, heroin, you can't really enhance it a lot without it turning into your life. But it's, I guess it's in some ways it's the dose that is the problem. And I mean, the do I guess I'm using that referring to, a substance or uh, the time involved in an activity because we talked about work and some of these other things. Like, mm-hmm. well, you know, having a work addiction could be positive in some ways too. But it's just like anything. It's just like when I was heavy, 
uh, and I want to eat half a cake or something. A chocolate cake is not bad. It's just, I guess, it's a dose. Right, <laughs> it's right. It's like right now, now I'm, you know, I've got my weight under control, and I'll have dinner, and I'll have a, a tiny piece of cake afterwards, and that's fine. But in the old days, it was, so, I, so there's nothing wrong with cake. I'm not demonizing cake or the substance. Although with heroin, you can't really say there's a, a healthy dose of heroin. But it's, it's, I guess it's the dose, it's the, the dose for, that makes it, a problem, you know. I can mm-hmm. have a glass of wine after dinner if you can, or with dinner, and that's fine. But if you're drinking two bottles, five bottles of wine, or something, that's the problem. So, um, that's very that's very true, and I I totally agree. I mean, point mo- about it. yes, yes, so, uh, moderation is the key for almost anything. I mean, you know, believe it or not, <laughs> you can literally die of water if you if you drink yeah, too much. I, it turns I into know, like I, poison, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, everything that's, I, I kind of a take that approach to life in general. Um, I mean, not necessarily conscious of it, but I, I, I definitely take that approach. I, I think anything is, is, you know, can be good or beneficial in moderation or bad in, in excess. Sure. Um, sure. So it's, it's, it's definitely about a balance, I think in general with life. Um, you know, I mean, people do it all the time, right? They, they have a health plan they stick to, and then they indulge one day or something, you know, and, uh, and, and that's really just to kind of sway that way a little bit. That's something else that's true that they've know through psychological research and whatnot. Uh, like you're talking, that's, they even use that with the cake example that, to deprive yourself of something, it's kind of like I was saying about ultimately you're going to kind of do what you want or your body craves or whatever. Um, you can't. Uh, you can, but then when you do, you usually overindulge. Um, so it's, yeah. you know, if you're like, okay, I don't want to eat a lot of cake, but you, if you do that and you eat a little bit here and there, it, it satisfies that craving. It satisfies the urge. And as a matter of fact, sure. like, like with smoking. I don't smoke anymore. Again, I smoke cigarettes for a long time. But if I happen to drink now once or, you know, a month or whatever, I actually smoke. I, I can smoke a cigarette or two. But what I do is I usually have 100s and I smoke half the cigarette. I put it out okay. and I feel I have the feeling like I've just smoked. I feel satisfied. My mind feels like I just smoked and I can literally go a long time and then smoke the other half of the cigarette. So it's, it's a weird thing. It's like, um, you know, I'm not totally depriving myself of it. So I still get the the craving satisfied. Um, but yeah, you know, of course, anything addictive, like we were saying, cigarettes, heroin, those types of things, you can't really do (laughs) and not, you know, have that addiction. Um, but uh, well, Henry, it's been great. Lastly here, I'd like to just get into a show segment that I do. It's called The Curious Five, and it's just where I ask you, again, you can give however long or short of an answer you want. It's just five personal preference questions. I like to ask people, see what their response is to it. Okay. So, the first one is, do you have a favorite or least favorite accent? Accent? Yes. Um, uh, you know, let me think here. <laughs> That's good. I've never thought about that question. Have to. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, you know, I, I was watching this documentary it's narrated by the director. He's got a, he has a British accent and it just makes everything he's saying. So it sounds so incisive. It's so smart. (laughs) It makes it so much better than if it were me doing it or, you know, Uh it just makes it really, you know, so, I mean, sometimes the British accent can be pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. That, um, well, that is interesting, the the effects that accents have on people one way or another. That's kind of why I asked the question, because it's interesting to me that 
how people interpret different accents. Um, so uh, British, uh, yeah, they and they do. That's why they use British people a lot, right? To <laughs> to say things that are supposed to sound smart. Uh, so, do you have um, a favorite or least favorite food or like cuisine? I try to do a low carb thing right now, so mm-hmm. I have. Well, my mother cooks pasta. I get anxiety because I know there's <laughs> that thing that you go crazy. You know what I mean? So I mean, I love all kinds of food, really. Uh-huh. Uh, but there's not much I don't like. But I kind of gravitate towards lean proteins now. Uh, a nice chicken dish I can eat. Uh, it's great, you know. St- uh, beef. I actually probably prefer chicken over beef. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it fills you up. It's kind of a slow burn, like really right. consistent burn, keeps your blood sugar level. So yeah, I mean, chicken, some barbecue chicken or something, or just some kind of a chicken dish, low carb thing. Yeah, carb. I love, I love bread too. I love bread too, but it's. Uh, yeah, that's that's me, man. That's my sort of downfall. It's, it's carbs. Yeah, I do. I love pasta, bread. I like all that stuff, you know, potatoes. Yeah, me too. But uh, they definitely stick with you, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I sort of sometimes I get like a spaced out from them too. It just like makes me uh, if I have to do something where I have to think or perform, I feel like I do better on some lean protein source. Right. If I do, you know, if I had to play a show or something and I eat a big bowl of pasta, I start to see stars. <laughs> yeah. You have carb hallucinations. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really do. Uh, she gets to be psychedelic, you know, like <laughs> wow. I've never, never done any psychedelics. I, I heard good things though, for therapeutic reasons, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, finding yourself and stuff. Oh, yeah, some, yeah. Well, well, you know, psychedelic in general kind of does that. It does sort of open it, expand your mind. Obviously, some chemically maybe not as good, but, um, but yeah, no, I, again, that's a whole other thing with the hallucinogens, but, okay, well, you mentioned about the the pasta making you see stars when you're trying to play, so that that leads us into the next one. (laughs) And this one I kind of know of uh, anybody who's been listening to the show, I guess would probably guess, but do you have a favorite music or genre? Uh, I really like, I like jazz, of course. I like mm-hmm. classical music. I like, I mean, I'm a big hip hop fan, 90s hip hop. Yeah. Oh yeah. Me too, man. Probably my favorite actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much everything. I mean, it sounds like it's such a top on answer. I like it all. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, certain music for certain things, you know? I mean, if I right. want to get, like, a charge, if I want to get going, I might go for some Motown or some hip-hop or something. Mm-hmm. Sometimes classical music can be more reflective and sort of intellectual, but that's visceral stuff, too. The jazz is great. But, yeah, sort of different music for different moods, I guess. Yeah, I mean, jazz incorporates a lot of that other stuff, too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I still love jazz. Jazz is great. So as far as that's more of like a listening, I know, you know, which is what I meant. But as far as playing do you, a piano, do you have a favorite genre to play? Well, I'm probably best at jazz. And uh, I mean, I played in rock bands, too, in a jam bands where we would play long solos and people would dance. And that's great, too. Mm-hmm. But jazz is sort of kind of like the ultimate in a lot of ways because... It's like the ultimate rhythmically and harmonically and um, complexity-wise. It can be the most challenging. You have chord progressions that are really moving around. Yes. Much more than... I mean, some rock tunes can be kind of involved chord-wise, too, but jazz kind of gives you the ultimate as far as challenging chord progressions and that kind of thing. And it can make it really fun to solo over the, in that context. So, yeah, jazz is... I got you. Yeah. I mean, I, I should say anything... Any, Improvisational music okay. play it's, it's very satisfying because you can really be yourself. That's true, right? And do your own thing with it. So, in most of the situations I'm in, almost all the musical situations I'm in professionally allow me to do that. So, that's the most satisfying. Yeah, and I know I know exactly what you're saying with that. Um, yeah, and jazz is man, jazz is it's it's definitely unique. <laughs> 
uh, it's got its own style feel. It's it's very intricate and layered kind of. You described it better just now, but yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean with jazz. All right, uh, number four here. Do you have do you have a favorite color? <laughs> um, probably black. You know, black. Uh-huh. Dark. I mean, I like just like, clothing wise. It's great to wear black. It's, stains don't show up and <laughs> right i don't know i mean you know i just, i'm always i played in bands where i have a friend in who's a drummer in albany you know he's yelling at me he's kind of a flamboyant guy he wears these red shirts and colored shirts and purple shirts and i would just show up with a black suit all the time black, <laughs> like black jacket and black pants and a black shirt and yeah i just feel like it's low maintenance all right it's kind of cool and I guess it kind of uh, doesn't stand out too much, maybe, and kind of lets you do a little key. Man, I got you. Okay, that's cool. Well, yeah, definitely as far as not showing <laughs> stains and blemishes, black is, well, unless it's a white one, but, you know. Uh, yeah, white shirts are just hell. I mean, I had a couple of white T-shirts and a white shirt. It is just, that's, yeah, that's just true hell. of cars, too, you know. If you had a white yeah. car, it shows everything. You got a black car, man, you don't have to wash that thing forever. Nobody even hardly knows. Yeah, especially <laughs> in the seats. Are, I've got tan colored seats in my car now. So they're kind of, they're light. I mean, actually, they're actually more like a light cream color or something. So dirt stains show up. But mm. if you have black seats, it's great. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, very kind of neutral color. Uh, it kind of goes with whatever. Um yeah. All right. That's cool. All right. And uh, last one is, do you have or what is your natural fear? Uh, I'm a little claustrophobic. Mm. Just, uh, I mean, I have a lot of fears. I live in fear all the time. Fear <laughs> of change, fear of success, fear of, I don't have to worry about the fear of success. If it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just, just like, yeah, just uh, fear of everything, really. Yeah, fear of everything. I understand that. Um, I'm, I'm claustrophobic. That's hands down a natural one for me. How bad How bad are you? Pretty bad. Pretty bad. Okay, now, can you, can you ride in? This This is the thing that can't. I mean, I, I just absolutely can't do it. Someone has a two-door car, and they want you to get in the back seat. <laughs> I can't do it. I don't like it. No. I mean, no. I, I, I freak out. I, I, oh, just knowing you can't really get out. I mean, I, that's just, I haven't done that in years. And I, I, I usually I just can't do it. I, I don't even try. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did two main things. I think from claustrophobia, probably in general. And for me, one is what you just said. When you feel like, or know that you can't get out of a situation at any given moment, and of course, the space itself. So, you know, you're in a small space, you start feeling it. But if you know you could get out, you could at least tolerate it a little bit longer. But yeah, I'm, I'm not good with that, man. Uh, the, I know exactly with the back seat. It's kind of a funny story, but um, when I was teenage, whatever, me and my two sisters and my dad were coming back from somewhere, he had to stop at the bank. So we're getting in. He used to sell cars, my dad. So he, at the time, was driving some kind of SUV or something. I don't know what it was. But so I'm getting in the back and I slipped <laughs> and I fell in between the, like the little console, in between the front and the back seat. Oh. But I was literally stuck. Oh, no. Yeah. And so at first, I'm like, uh, get, help me. I can't get up. And, you know, my sisters were laughing at me. But it instant went from laughing to panic. Sure. Because I was, I felt that claustrophobic, that stuck. And I just started freaking out, man. I mean, I literally, I was like yelling and twitching and, you know, get me out of here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, claustrophobic is, you're not getting away from that one. Yeah. I don't like it. I, I flew, I haven't flown, in, I think it's been about 10 years. But I remember flying to Florida and the plane was really tiny and then the the bathroom was just so absurdly small. I remember I just was, you know, I was in there, I was patting. It wasn't even worth it. It just was terrifying to me. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, planes are another one. I've only been on a few, yeah, but they I don't, suck, I don't like man. it. The planes are much smaller I now, know. and they pack people in. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. Do you have a fear of heights? 
Uh, I don't love heights, but if I had to choose, yeah, I don't love heights, mm-hmm. but if I had to choose between, I mean, it's just being in the air doesn't bother me so much about flying. The takeoff and the landing, I don't like. But, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't love not in love with heights either. But claustrophobia is definitely worse. I mean, that's a bad, <laughs> that's just a terrible feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on both of those. Well, Henry, uh, I really want to thank you for reaching out to the show, getting in touch with me. Thank you. Um, So I do. I really want to thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time to be on the show and just being open, honest, and real and sharing your experience with everybody. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Dave here. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. As always, I want to thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I really hope you got something out of it. That's what this is all about for me, trying to form, educate, and inspire people. The sooner people realize the veil of lies we've bought into, and that we already possess all the knowledge, resources, and technology we need for sustainability and abundance for everyone, the sooner the transition can start. Please feel free to email, follow, share, comment, like, subscribe. I welcome any and all feedback or support. And I hope you'll tune in next time for another episode of the All Real Show. We are one. One.